I will welcome everyone on behalf of the Minda de Gunsberg Center for European Studies. My name is Elaine Papoulias, and I am the executive director here. And it's really an honor and a pleasure to bring this group together. Um, it is wonderful once again to partner with the Center for Hellenic Studies. And I thank Mark Schiffsky, the director of the Center for Hellenic Studies and the Grove Professor of Classics at Harvard for joining us. I also thank the Consulate General of Boston, uh, Consulate General of Greece here in Boston, Mr. Stratos Ephthimiou for also joining us. And of course, Bruce Clark for once again being so generous with his time um, and sharing his insights on his new book today. Without further ado, Stratos, Mr. Ephthimiou, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elaine, and uh, all involved centers and partners. Uh, it is an honor to welcome Bruce Clark, an author with a rare knowledge of Greece's religious, cultural, and political dynamics. Bruce is a true modern Philhellene. He speaks Greek. He lived in Athens for several years, and he is uniquely positioned to reflect on the complex realities that have defined Athens. Bruce and I first uh, interacted in 2004, just before I joined the Greek Foreign Ministry. And while he was doing his monumental research for his book, Twice a Stranger, uh, a book which is a compass guiding anyone who wants to understand the dynamics on the exchange of populations between modern Greece and Turkey. The issue is also mentioned in the chapter that deals with the settlement of the Greek refugees from Asia Minor around Athens in the refugee neighborhoods such as Kokinia, Nea Ionia, and Drapechona, where my grandparents were also settled as refugees. It is fascinating to read how refugees shaped the demographic and spatial expansion of Athens in the 20s and 30s, affecting city planning and dramatically changing Athens' social fabric. The refugees, Bruce writes, brought rich social and entrepreneurial energy, leading to the city's rebirth as a result of their creativity that was infused in the arts, politics, social movements, and economy. The reader can naturally compare the current challenges related to these problems and to the problems regarding feeding, housing, schooling of refugees now and then. So Athens' story is a story of rise, glory, decadence, rebirth, but also resilience. Bruce, like the Greek Nobel laureate Seferis and other refugee felt the importance of these rocks. And he examines all these phases of Athens history and the transition to democracy, EU membership and crisis from the original angle of environmental challenges. In that way, Bruce Clark breathes fresh air into the research of Athens. And we see in the book a city that is faced with a continuous challenge of how to harness development and tourism while limiting their impact on the environment. Congratulations, Bruce. Thank you, Stratos. Um, may, I, may, may I say a bit about, uh, about my book? We, we will now give the floor to Professor Shivsky. Okay. A formal Let me just... introduction before you, you jump in, but we're very sure, sure. excited. That's fine, that's fine. Thank, Many you. Ideas. Sure. Thank you so much. No, I don't want to take uh, much time. I'm Mark Shevsky, director of the Center for Hellenic Studies. Um, Harvard University is uniquely fortunate to have um, a um, separate center for Hellenic studies in Washington, DC, where I'm speaking to you from now. And our concern is with the entire Hellenic tradition uh, from um, antiquity down to the modern day. So um, Bruce, your book uh, fits uh, perfectly into our scholarly agenda here. And it's a great pleasure to be able to welcome you to this event and have the opportunity to hear uh, from you. Uh, and that's what I mainly want to pass to right now. Uh, Stratos has already given uh, an elegant uh, introduction um, of your scholarly attainments. I would simply um, mention um, that, that Bruce is a distinguished uh, lecturer, a journalist, uh, and author with two books uh, to his credit, uh, the first on uh, post-Soviet uh, nationalism a topic which is uh, now relevant, um, unfortunately, to our uh, current uh, predicament, uh, but also um, a book on uh, forced migration uh, between Greece and Turkey in the 1920s, which Stratos mentioned, and now this uh, marvelous new book, um, Athens, um, City of Wisdom, which really takes up 
the entire history of Athens from uh, its beginning to, um, to the present day. So um, without further ado, I'll hand over to uh, Bruce to say a few words about the book. Um, after that, I will be happy to moderate uh, the Q&A. So please uh, put your questions into the Q&A using that function uh, at the bottom of the screen. And I will attempt to synthesize uh, the questions and uh, moderate the discussion. So I hope we'll have time uh, both to hear from Bruce um, about the marvelous book and uh, to hear from you, the members of the audience, with your perspectives, insights, and, uh, and questions. So without further ado, then uh, the floor is yours, uh, Bruce. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of you uh, for your very generous words, your very uh, 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 gracious mention of my previous writing. Um, I should say that in my other lives, uh, I've also been a working journalist. Um, I've worked for titles like the London Times and uh, the Financial Times, The Economist. Uh, I don't claim to be an academic scholar, um, but I suppose uh, if I should have any skills at all, uh, they are those of the working reporter, you know, somebody who knows how to marshal facts and bash out a story. That's sort of uh, what, what, what I've been trained to do. Um, as you both kindly mentioned, uh, I am a published author in the field of modern Greek history. Uh, and about four, four and a half years ago, I was approached by a publisher in London, Head of Zeus, with a challenge. Um, it was pointed out that there are very long histories of cities like uh, Istanbul, Rome, London, um, but there didn't seem to be um, a what you might call a middle brow history of the entire history of Athens, uh, going back to prehistorical times, legendary times, and taking us right up to the 21st century. Um, and it, there were certainly you know, books of arcane scholarship on that subject, but there didn't seem to be one that was aimed at the middle brow intelligent reader. And that was what I was challenged uh, to do. And I rose to the challenge to the best of my ability. Um, I spent a couple of years living in Athens, uh, enjoying all its wonderful benefits and challenges. Um, I was then locked down in my native Northern Ireland for two years, rather severely locked down, um, staying in a small, relatively remote village. Uh, but it turned out to be a perfect place uh, to work away on my Athenian labors um, and finally managed to finish the book uh, published by Head of Zeus in London and by Pegasus uh, in the United States. Uh, you've, you've shown the American edition. Uh, this is what the British edition looks like. Um, both very attractive covers, uh, you know, thanks to both publishers, um, Athens City of Wisdom. Why, why the title, you may say? Um, I suppose the title reflects the fact um, that Athens was a city of great cultural and intellectual and even spiritual importance uh, for much longer than it was a place of outstanding geopolitical importance. I mean, really, the height of its geopolitical power uh, was, as we know, in the 5th and 4th centuries BCE, um, and yet for a good millennium or so longer than that, um, it retained enormous prestige uh, as a center of learning and a place where you know, intelligent young people from all over the East Mediterranean would come to study. Um, and indeed, you know, the word Athenian became metaphorical uh, for a certain kind of Greek wisdom and learning and sophistication. So uh, in a sense, the outstanding feature of Athens uh, has not been uh, you know, huge military or naval power. That's sometimes been the case, not always. Um, the most consistently outstanding feature has been wisdom, cleverness, uh, you know, uh, brain power. Uh, and that was even the case in the, in the golden age of Athens. Uh, people respected Athens, um, of course, for its geopolitical power, for its magnificent navy, uh, but most of all, for its culture and sophistication, the city of wisdom then. Now, uh, as I mentioned, I have a some track record as a writer on modern Greece. Really, to reinvent myself as a writer on ancient Greece, I had to go back to my school days often. Uh, I did uh, attend a school in England that specialized in Latin and ancient Greek, and I uh, was given every chance to learn ancient Greek uh, as, as, as a schoolboy and do my university entrance exams uh, in the topic of Latin and ancient Greek. 
uh, but I had to uh, uh, brush up that knowledge quite considerably uh, in order to have any understanding at all of the latest insights into ancient Athens. Um, and and I mean, it's a very reasonable question. I mean, is there really anything we can usefully say uh, that unites Athens uh, in all eras of its history, you know, from being you know, the premier political power in Greece uh, to being uh, you know, a, a place of uh, sophistication, uh, but no special political power of its own, uh, to being you know, a, a forgotten village, really, uh, controlled by the Franks, the Catalans, the Neapolitan bankers, then under Ottoman times, and then rising again as the capital of modern Greece. Uh, is there anything useful that connects all these eras? Is it, is it simply uh, a, a, a fluke of history? Uh, that's a reasonable question. Um, and I find myself coming back and back uh, to the fundamental sort of geographical parameters of Athens and Attica uh, and how those played out at different eras in history. Um, now, it seems to me that Thucydides has a very sophisticated thing to say about Attica um, and how its physical environment affected uh, the politics of that place. Um, he actually argues that the relative poverty of the soil of Attica uh, had a positive effect on the politics of the place. Um, in the sense, that, as he points out, um, you know, countries or regions with richer soil tend to be endlessly fought over. Um, and then, of course, you know, when one faction uh, conquers a richly endowed place, uh, you know, you have an early version of the resources curse, uh, and you know, I mean. Politics uh, is usually not very interesting because you know, the opposition can be bought off with, with, with resources. Um, but in the case of Athens, the relative poverty of the soil, so Thucydides argued, um, was uh, a, 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 a stimulus to creativity. Uh, it was a stimulus to extroversion, uh, to going out and founding colonies, of course, um, but also having great loyalty to Athens itself. Um, and above all, a stimulus to brilliant political innovation. Um, so that was I mean, that was the, the analysis of Thucydides of why Athens became great. And I find it a very sophisticated one. And I think to some extent it anticipates modern thinking about the resources curse. How if you have a lot of oil or some other precious commodity, uh, that often means that you don't have very interesting politics. What other sort of permanent features? Of course, I mean, I mean, in every era of Athenian history, you know, the Acropolis stands out as a place of enormous strategic importance and indeed enormous spiritual importance. And perhaps these days uh, we underestimate the spiritual importance. I mean, for it, this place was a temple of monotheism, of um, you know, the, the Greek Orthodox faith, uh, the Roman Catholic faith, Islam, uh, for longer, in fact, historically, uh, than it was a place where the polytheist religion was practiced. It has been, in one way or another, perceived as a holy place, not only, as it were, the surface of the Acropolis, but uh, the caves which pockmark uh, the rock, uh, all these places, have been uh, endowed with a sense of holiness um, you know, th throughout the ages. And that's a, a significant uh, permanent feature of Athens. Uh, the fact that the Acropolis is almost impossible to take by conventional warfare. Um, you can, uh, again and again in history, it's been proven that you can possibly starve the occupants of the Acropolis into surrender, uh, but by conventional warfare, uh, it's almost impossible to dislodge them. It is a very, very uh, powerful strong point. Uh, and that remained the case even when Athens itself was little more than a village. What else? Um, the glories of Athens and Attica have always been um, the mountains uh, that surround, envelop, protect Athens, um, uh, Mount, using modern Greek pronunciation, Mount Imitos, um, uh, Pendele, Parnitha, Egalio, um, each one with its own particular gift. Uh, you know, the magnificent marble of Mount Pendele, the honey from Imitos, Egalio uh, Parnitha as places of uh, uh, of defence and protection, um, and places of, of, of greenery as well, of, 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 of um, places of, of important vegetation. Um, so those have been among the blessings of Athens and Attica, 
uh, through the ages. Um, then also the, the rivers, you know, that's, and, and we've half forgotten that now, I'm sorry to say, um, the, 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 the great rivers um, that flowed through Athens, Kephistos, uh, Ilistos, Eridanos. Um, if we read uh, you know, certain passages in, in Plato, uh, there's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lovely description of, of uh, you know, Socrates bathing his feet in the Ilistos, or maybe one of the streams feeding the Ilistos and uh, enjoying the coolness and all the you know, beautiful scents and the remarkably rich vegetation. Uh, it, it's obvious that uh, in ancient times, uh, the rivers of Athens were an absolute joy of the place. Um, and that did uh, survive unto relatively modern times uh, as well. Uh, it could also be said of Athens um, that uh, you know, the, the center of the city is um, both at a safe distance from the sea and also a convenient distance from the sea. Um, so it's a place uh, that can easily become a great maritime and trading power, um, and yet it's also comparatively safe from pirates uh, in comparison with some ports. Uh, at various e eras of history, that was you know, that proved to be a very important factor. It was near the sea, but not not on the sea. What and and finally, you know, one other sort of perennial issue in the history of Athens, um, you know, there is, I mean, one of the things that Athen ancient Athenians were proud of somehow uh, is that they had achieved a kind of synergy between the city of Athens and its environs and Attica, in other words. Um, and this was you know, expressed by you know, the, the, the myth of Theseus bringing the, you know, the, the, the people of Athens and Attica together but in a much more concrete way um, by, in the realm of real history, um, by you know, the, the political genius of Cleisthenes uh, in 508 BCE, when he laid the foundations of the Athenian democracy. Um, and he found the way to divide the population uh, in, in, into 10 tribes. Uh, within, uh, in, within each of those tribes, uh, he gathered people from the, the, the various parts of the region, the interior, the coastal areas, uh, the city itself. Um, and so um, uh, purely local loyalties were dissolved to some extent. Um, and you know, an enormous uh, and, and very skillfully constructed cohesion was built um, uh, between Athens and its immediate surroundings. And, and, and to see that in a more human way, in a more, more sort of humorous way, if you like, I mean, just, just remember the opening scenes in um, the play The Acarnians by Aristophanes, when, you know, a grumpy old farmer is coming in to, uh, to take his uh, place in the assembly debates. Uh, he's, he has different interests and different ideas about life than people who live right in the heart of the city. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, he, uh, he is a voting member of the assembly uh, and he's you know, determined to have to say on matters of war and peace, matters of administration. Um, and it, it, in a very vivid way, uh, uh, it, it, it shows us that the Athenian democracy found you know, sophisticated mechanisms for integrating uh, the interests of city dwellers and people in the immediate countryside. So, I mean, just tremendous uh, political genius in, 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 in devising arrangements that somehow, uh, that, 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 that somehow reflected the public interest. Uh, that's been, you know, a, 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 a feature of ancient Athens. Then, um, uh, let's turn to the present day, um, which I, I sort of, I, I, I knew much better uh, when I began writing this book, um, to ask ourselves, you know, in, I mean, in, in, in what respect uh, are, have the gifts of ancient Athens been uh, preserved in the present day? And are there any lessons at all uh, that we can learn from the dilemmas of ancient Athens as we consider the dilemmas of today? Uh, well, I mean, uh, clearly, you know, the, the blessings of, of, of Attica uh, remained intact, you know, right to the present era, I mean, right to right into the 20th century, um, the rivers were still flowing, um, you know, the, 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 the woods were still uh, broadly intact uh, out, out, outside Athens, you know, it was still a place that was uh, sort of both on the sea and safely separated from the sea in a, in a different sense. So many of those eternal blessings uh, were very much present in the construction of modern Athens. I think if there's one thing that characterizes you know, the emergence of modern Athens, it is um, uh, in a sense, improvisation and ad hocery, um, which often 
worked much better uh, than uh, top-down planning or you know, uh, uh, imagining that everything could be foreseen in advance. I mean, uh, one of the images I have of the very, very early years of Athens as the capital of the Kingdom of Greece um, is the contrast between the great, you know, the royal palace, now the parliament, uh, a great barrack of a building, uh, you know, um, built to Bavarian design, um, and let me say, not the most refined of Bavarian design, um, and, 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 and an enormous amount of resources and skill had to be marshaled um, to, to erect this structure in the heart of Athens. And then sort of, you know, a matter of hundreds of meters away, uh, you have the very, you know, uh, simple and in a way primitive dwelling places of Anafiotica on the slopes of the Acropolis. Now, what is Anafiotica? Um, it is, you know, it's a cluster of houses uh, sort of built or at least redesigned by people from the tiny Aegean island of Anafi. Now, they were among the workers from the Cyclades who had been brought into Athens uh, to work on the royal palace. Um, and they found, you know, some, some pretty primitive pre-existing dwellings on the slopes of the Acropolis, uh, and they adapted them to their own needs, uh, and they made the place uh, feel very like a village on a Cycladic island. Uh, and you can still have the great pleasure of wandering around Anafiotica uh, and imagining yourself to be in a Cycladic village. There's something very human and practical and sort of normal in a sense about the atmosphere in that lovely little locality. Um, so you know, uh, it, it seems to me that era is a good advertisement for ad hocery and in a sense uh, and rather a warning against uh, what can happen um, if you know, top-down planning, especially top-down planning conceived in another country in another environment uh, is, is, is imposed on the Attic landscape. Then you know, we mentioned um, the era of the refugees in 1920s, 1930s. Uh, when Athens doubled in population uh, and, uh, and, and when Greater Athens really took shape, that both the northern suburbs emerged and also Athens and Piraeus sort of merged into a single urban space. Now, of course, if you read history, you'll see that you know, uh, there were international agencies, the Refugee Settlement Commission, which um, you know, undertook the provision of housing to the refugees. Uh, and you know, Italian new districts emerged, Kokinia, Keseriani, Neionia, and so on. Um, but to me, you know, the most uh, important thing that happened uh, to the refugees was their own ingenuity, in a sense. I mean, they're, they're, you know, the, the self-building, also, uh, also, also, as it were, adding to the fairly primitive housing that they were supplied with by you know, d you know, digging their own sewerage system when necessary, by, in a very intriguing way, um, adapting the dowry system, uh, which they had brought from communities in Asia Minor, um, so that you know, even, even a tiny bit of urban space in a refugee home uh, could become uh, a, a, a dowry and then a nucleus of a new household. Um, so what's significant to me about those refugee communities is not what was done for them, uh, but what the refugees did for themselves. I mean, they very, very quickly became you know, active, passionate, self-sustaining places full of energy and political passion uh, and, uh, and, and contributing very, very substantially to, to, the, to, to the lifeblood of Athens. Then think of the 1950s, uh, the 1950s, early 60s, you know, the era of the Polykatikia, um, in other words, the five-story, four or five-story building, which became the standard sort of building model uh, for the vast extension of Athens that occurred in the post-war years. Now, I mean, nothing beautiful about those buildings, you may say, and it has made you know, the, the cityscape of, of Athens somewhat monotonous. Um, and yet, uh, you know, applied on a sort of micro-human scale, the Polykatikia system had huge, um, huge merits, really, uh, in the sense that, I mean, to, to explain those to those who don't know it, I mean, it was a, a, the, the reality of Athens in the 50s and 60s was that if you owned, uh, you know, any small plot of urban space, whether there was a house on it or not, you know, you'd probably be approached by a contractor, not necessarily a big contractor, you know, a small contractor, who would say, let me build on your plot, say a five-story apartment building, you can have one or two apartments for yourself, you know, uh, one for yourselves, one for your, you know, the next generation, and, you know, uh, we'll, we'll have the others, and, uh, you know, and we'll all be winners. Uh, and, you know, by that, 
very simple and almost spontaneous method. Um, you know, uh, Greater Athens went through uh, another phase of vast expansion. Not, I mean, not pretty or aesthetically satisfying or you know a, a, a model of urban development in some ways. But, but I, I would argue that it's um, it was a, a kind of a semi-spontaneous development that did at least uh, you know keep the city as a sort of um, uh, you know, functioning urban space. Where utilities worked, uh, and where you know, an, an, an enormous influx of population uh, was somehow uh, dealt with and absorbed uh, successfully. Um, now, what's what's so what, what's happening now in the early twenty first century? I mean, it seems to me it's it's both both a very exciting time and a very challenging time. And to state the you know, uh, Athens remains sort of uh, you know, hypertrophic, sort of too big in some ways in, in, in relation to Greece as a whole. Um, one, of the, one of the effects of the, of the economic crisis was that there was a trickle of people, uh, including a trickle of quite talented young people back to the provinces, back to their home villages, um, but an, a, a, a only a trickle, relatively speaking. It hasn't really changed the fact um, that you know, Athens is still uh, uh, a, a vast city in relation to the size of Greece as a whole. Uh, and, is, and, and I think it, you know, it, it would be hard to deny that it sucks energy to some extent out of other parts of, of uh, provincial Greece. Um, and uh, when I speak of challenges, a lot of them remind me very much of the challenges faced in ancient times, uh, in the sense that you know, there is a challenge of cohesion, of coherence, that, that um, you know, uh, Athens sprawls over a, a, a vast physical area, uh, you know, ranging from uh, the relatively prosperous areas in the north and east um, uh, to the much less prosperous and environmentally degraded, degraded areas uh, in the west. Uh, on the coast, uh, you know, we now have the prospect of, you know, very uh, uh, sort of glitzy developments uh, uh, in, in the area that used to be the Alinicon Airport, which will be you know, no doubt exciting to behold, uh, but, you know, it, it will, it, uh, it, it creates the risk of, you know, a very hot, very thirsty city um, that is just sort of uh, struggling in a way to, uh, you know, to, to to, to, to maintain um, its sort of ecological balances and to, you know, to uh, 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 and, and to maintain uh, sort of sanitation and basic urban services. Uh, I mean, I, um, I would very much like to think that the ingenuity and resilience that has characterized Athens in all eras uh, will, will come into play now uh, and, and will solve those problems. But the sheer vastness of Athens, you know, undoubtedly and visibly, you know, creates a problem of coherence. You know, the problem that was so elegantly solved by Cleisthenes' political mechanisms. Um, and it's an irony in a way that um, you know, the, the municipality of Athens only covers you know, a relatively tiny share of the greater urban you know, uh, metropolis of Athens. So the municipality, however, well run cannot of itself solve the traffic problems uh you know it it it, it, it cannot solve the problems of the of, of the greater athenian conurbation um there is apparently a, a, a proposal underfoot to create an agency um that will coordinate the issues of traffic in 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 greater athens uh currently handled by seven separate agencies so that that, that that's a positive sign um, but it, it seems to me that in the era of climate change and you know, rising temperatures and also changing patterns of, of, of rainfall uh, so that you get literally cloud bursts, I mean, just enormous quantities of rain falling in a very short time, then uh, I mean, uh, we're in a situation where ad hocery uh, and uh, ad hoc solutions won't necessarily work anymore. Now, are the right solutions being found? Well, cer certainly, you know, certainly some good and interesting things are happening. Uh, you know, proposals to make you know uh, uh, pocket parks all over Athens, um, pockets of greenness uh, with you know perennial vegetation. Um, uh, proposals to greatly you know, uh, upgrade the environment of Mount Lycabettus. Uh, to put, uh, you know, to, to replace the asphalt roads with surfaces that are more, uh, that, 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 that will absorb water. Uh, so, and, and, and also a very exciting proposal to uh, you know, reactivate Adrian's aqueduct. 
Adrian Zakudak being an, an, an extraordinary piece of engineering, 2,000 years old, which was still in use in the early 20th century. Um, and there's a proposal now to at least use some of the waters from Hadrian's aqueduct, uh, not, for, not for drinking water, uh, but for the city's other water needs. Uh, so some, some very positive and ingenious proposals are being floated. Um, you know, on, 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 on the other hand, you know, being skeptical, there is you know, an, an, a new metro line being built, which will no doubt help the coherence of the city in its own way, line number four, but it will also, in the short term, it may actually take green space away. Uh, and, you know, the authorities have promised uh, not to do that and to, you know, uh, and, and to compensate fully in, in, in terms of vegetation for any damage that this new line uh, brings about. But, you know, uh, we're still waiting to see what exactly the consequences of metro line number number four will be so there are some open questions there um i in in discussing you know the ecology of greater athens uh for this book i mean i spoke to politicians of all political persuasions i spoke uh, at great length to stephanos manos who was has been responsible for many in my view of the most beneficial infrastructure uh, uh, projects in in in, in greater athens um, including you know the the, the final um, execution of the Atikiovos, the network uh, of roads uh, all over the region, connecting Athens with the rest of Greece, uh, and, and an enormous benefit to the region. Um, I also, uh, I, I spoke to one of the most passionate young environmentalists uh, in Greece, Kriton Arsenis, who has uh, uh, been involved with different political parties over the years, but is all, but is consistently passionate uh, in his environmental advocacy uh, of the Athens region. Um, you know, he, he, his current, one of his current passions uh, is to create what he calls green corridors, uh, linking uh, the the mountains of Athens um, with the green spaces uh, that already exist, you know, the fragile, and, and he calls this rewilding. Uh, now, uh, I don't know how practical that is, but it seems you know, very, very much uh, in, in, in the right spirit of things. And, you know, and, and some in, in, in modern history, some extraordinary things have been done uh, to re revitalize uh, Athens as a city. Uh, for example, you know, the, the water system that was created in the 1930s, uh, which links the center of Athens uh, with, with, with Marathon, with a dam near, near, near Marathon, I mean, that was at many, many levels uh, and a boon to the city. It, it, it gave employment to the people working on the dam. It was actually, they were working in much healthier conditions than most other people in Athens at the time. Um, you know, and and uh, uh, it, it greatly improved public health in Athens. Uh, so there is a track record of really visionary projects uh, which, um, which solve that problem of coherence, which bring you know, the beauty and the fertility of the mountains and the rivers uh, into, into the center of Athens. You know, uh, th there is a, a good track record in modern times of solving those problems. Of course, you know, um, it, it brings you back to the fact that the rivers themselves have almost disappeared. Uh, the Eridanos is now a tiny trickle of a rivulet, uh, you know, running through the lovely archaeological site called the Gamikos Cemetery, uh, and you can still see a few turtles there. You can still just about imagine what it was like uh, when it was a decent-sized river, you know, uh, leading the way to Elefsina to Eleusis, uh, but it's a very pale shadow of its former self. You know, the big rivers, the Kifisos, and the uh, is is well, where it's visible. It's not a pretty sight. Um, the Ilistos is only visible uh, as, a, as, as a as a as a tiny stream in places. And the, but there is a project to re you know to, to re expose parts of it. Um, so there is you know, there are very very serious issues uh, around uh, the, the the watering and the greening of central Athens. Uh, and my, you know my, my 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 hope and my ultimately my confidence is that. You know the ingenuity, the resilience, um, the, the the capacity for inspired ad hocery uh, will will somehow solve those problems in a dynamic way. So that that's that's what I have to say. <laughs> well, excellent. Uh, thanks uh, very much, Bruce, for those very uh, stimulating uh, stimulating remarks that that really cover many of the bases that are that are treated uh, throughout your um, book. I don't see uh, at the moment um, any questions um, coming through um, in the Q&A um, as yet, although I encourage uh, participants to pose your questions um, in, that, uh, in that venue. Um, maybe I could uh, just uh, start off the discussion by picking up on 
a very important theme that that you raised uh, this connection between uh, democratic uh, Athens and the environment so not just that Athens was a democracy but that somehow the democratic character of Athens um, inspired or solved this this problem of of civic cohesion which um, then addressed um, environmental challenges to some extent or was reflected in a positive attitude to the to the environment. I, I think, I mean, one thing I take from your presentation is that one can perhaps think of Athens and Attica as a kind of microcosm for um, solving some of these problems, uh, for example, by connecting democracy and, and the environment. Uh, do you think that uh, we can generalize from um, the history that you have um, recounted here to solving larger global and, and national um, challenges. I mean, it doesn't occur to me that that uh, democratic societies are necessarily uh, more respectful of the environment than non-democratic societies. Maybe one could, could disagree. But anyway, my question is really, do you think we can generalize uh, from the Athenian case to larger political structures? Well, that's a very interesting question. I mean, well, I, 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 I'll begin on a personal note. Um, I've just, you know, had the honour of of participating in a in a commemoration of a very very fine sort of public intellectual uh, and environmental campaigner in Athens, uh, Costa Caras, um, who who was both uh, in his time a very active campaigner against the colonel's dictatorship uh, and also for the environment and the built heritage, and he saw the two things as absolutely interconnected. Uh, because, you know, he, and, and, and contrary to what many of his friends thought, I mean, when in 1972, he founded what became the most important environmental NGO in Greece, you know, many of his friends said, what are you doing? You know, we need to be struggling against the dictatorship, to which he said, um, uh, on, you know, the, these, these causes are interlinked because actually the dictators are real uh, sinners in terms of planning and the environment, uh, and we need to fight these causes together. Now, again, on, on a different personal note, uh, you know, I became involved in sort of in in Soviet and post-Soviet affairs. Uh, you know, as as a reporter in Moscow from 1989 onwards, uh, and you know, it's it's it, it's striking that uh, in many many parts of the then Soviet Union, uh, you know, democratic struggles began as environmental struggles. You know, in 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 situations where the Communist Party still had a monopoly of power, there was one issue where ordinary people could protest. Uh, and that was, you know, uh, uh, you know, lakes being poisoned or forests being cut down. Uh, somehow, uh, com campaigning over the environment became a sort of stalking horse in a very beneficial way uh, for broader uh, political campaigns. And I, sp I suppose what I would say is this: I mean, is that um, you know, de democracies don't necessarily produce kind of benign environmental decisions, but they do at least prevent terrible ones you know uh, that, that, that that's that, um, when when things are being done to the environment that are manifestly disastrous you know, that does show up in the democratic process so it's at least at a, at a minimum it's a safety valve against environmental harm yeah thank you very much one would also um, perhaps mention east germany where the uh, uh, environmental protests were extremely important Very in the events of, of 1989 um, as uh, as well. I see we do now have some um, some questions uh, coming in um, here um, in the um, in the Q and A, and um, let me um, let me take uh, one first from uh, Dimitri Sotiropoulos. And uh, Mr. Sotropoulos asks, uh, in your opinion, over the past 50 years, which among the past policy decisions regarding town planning, architecture, construction style, environmental management, public transportation, or traffic in Athens has been the worst negatively affecting city life today? So which is the worst? Gosh, gosh, gosh. Which is, that, that, that's a very good yes, because of course there are many Pollyannish answers one could say about the best. I mean. Um, well, let me know that's hmm. um, Well, it's obvious, it, it's kind of intuitively obvious that some very serious problems are arising with um, traffic in, in, in Athens at this very moment, and the sense that the traffic uh, sort of died right down during the COVID area, 
uh, and uh, it's now um, you know rising back to pre-COVID levels, and it's becoming frankly a bit chaotic. Um, and you know, so I mean, uh, uh, so, I mean and I, I, I'm not saying that there's a decision one can pinpoint, but there is a, you know, a, a very acute situation developing with with traffic simply because I suppose people got complacent about this issue during during the COVID time, and it's now bouncing back with with a vengeance. I mean, I will. I mean, I will. I know I can easily tell you what many conservationists would say is the worst decision in Greece recently, uh, but it doesn't affect Athens. And I'll, I'll, I will, if I may, if, if you'll give him permission, I will, I will say uh, what that was. Uh, and and I'm, I'm simply re reflecting the opinion of many of my archaeologists and conservationist friends. Um, there is a, 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 a huge concern over the decision to press ahead uh, with a metro station in Thessaloniki, which will involve the dismantling of very precious Byzantine antiquities. Now, the theory is that they'll all be put back together somewhere else. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, but many people are skeptical about this. Um, and they feel that, you know, the, the, the archaeological community has been sort of bulldozed into accepting a decision that really doesn't respect a very important era of Greece's past. Uh, and they see that as a, uh, you know, as, as, as a worrying sign of what might be to come uh, in, in other places. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't give you a single terrible decision in, in Athens, but I know if you asked any of my conservationist friends, what's the worst thing happening in Greece, they would say it's a Thessaloniki metro. Excellent, thanks. Um, we have another question on an environmental theme from uh, Megan Richards. Um, as follows, uh, Greece has a big decarbonization challenge and it would make eminent sense to have solar panels on most houses and apartment buildings, but the bureaucracy of having them installed is a huge challenge. Have you seen any progress in addressing these clean energy and decarbonization issues? Yeah, yeah. In yes. I, well, I think yes, that, that's absolutely right. And uh, if you know, it, it, uh, that um, there is a huge missed opportunity in solar energy uh, in, 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 in Athens and in Greece in general. Um, and you know, it, it, uh, if you compare what's happened in Portugal and Spain, um, Portugal in particular at the moment, uh, you know, this, it, it, it's, it's palpable that Greece and Athens ought to be doing more to encourage solar energy and indeed meet you know, a very significant share of its energy needs from, from, uh, fr from solar energy. Um, you know, if you compare, say, with uh, Israel or you know many countries in the region, uh, there's there's uh, a, a strong sense of a missed opportunity. And then there is, I think, many people would say that we are in danger of a mishandled opportunity with respect to wind power, which is, of course, you know, I mean, a very very important uh, you know factor in the future energy mix and, and a, a very important uh, you know route to decarbonization. Um, but I think that you know many of my environmentalist friends would say that when you know wind power is concentrated and when you know, in, in in enormous amounts in on certain islands or you know in certain I may say newly denuded forested forests you know that that, that, that uh, it, it 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 harms the environment more than it more than it helps whereas solar power seems frankly to be win-win uh, and I wish more of it would, would be encouraged in Greece excellent so uh, let's uh, shift gears a little bit to address uh, several questions which touch on the topic of continuities between ancient and modern Athens which you uh, mentioned um, Bruce as you're sort of guiding guiding okay. light uh, in this work. Um, we have a question, um, and I'll read three questions on this yeah. theme. Yeah. One is from uh, Philip Resnick, um, who asks, uh, does the theme of wisdom hold up as well for the Athens of today as the Athens of antiquity? Um, another uh, from Anastasia Haralabidou, uh, from its glorious past as thriving center of phenomenal philosophical, cultural, scientific, as well as aesthetical miracles, Athens in its present state seems far away from the golden city that it once was. Which would you identify as the main factors and events that disrupted the city's trajectories? Any conscious individual cannot cease to wonder which were the pivotal moments that brought the city in its present state. And then um, I have um, one, um, there's one further uh, question from uh, G. Marnelos. Uh, after late antiquity, Athens never existed as an important cultural or political center until Greek independence in the 19th century. 
uh, it almost ceased to exist in most ways. You think there were some genuine local channels through which some of the character of its antique culture survived into the modern era. Yeah. Well, good. I mean, no, no, yes, well, so, some, some very interesting and challenging questions there. Um, now, um, uh, to, well, to, to, talking about, you know, I mean, has has modern Athens? Uh, I mean, has it become a city of wisdom, or you know, a city of intelligence, or and uh, you know, uh, or could it? Is there anything that could be done to realize that potential? Well, I mean, I'll maybe come at that from two angles. And um, now, I mean, it, well, it, 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 it's a, a striking feature, and I'm sure I'm speaking to some living examples of this phenomenon. Um, that um, the universities of the world are filled with very, very distinguished Greek academics. Um, uh, and yet the universities of Greece itself uh, you know, don't you know, realize the country's potential uh, as, uh, well, in terms of, um, as I say, attracting students. Um, you know, not, uh, you know, Greece is not, uh, with apologies for a broad generalization, uh, you know, is, is not considered an, an, an especially attractive country for a foreign student to come and study in. Um, it's not, it's not as much of a hub of academic learning and study and research uh, as it should be if you look at the you know the array of you know frankly brilliant greek talent that is to be found in you know every university the length and breadth of 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 of, of, of the western world really um and what you know what's what's the problem there well um you know there is uh you know there are a lot of ideological constraints uh, in, in in Greek higher education, uh, including you know a, a very very deep and principled uh, objection to private uh, higher education, to fee paying uh, higher education. Now again, I mean, I, you know, I feel uh, you know it's um, uh, rude of me maybe even to interfere in something that is so dear to to many Greek hearts. Uh, it, it is clearly a very you know, deeply cherished principle uh, that you know, we, we don't want education, higher education to be a source of financial ex exploitation and you know, to, uh, that, it, that it should be a public good. Um, but you know, uh, it, it, if I compare it with say the, 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 the Turkish university system uh, where you see, it seems to me a very uh, sort of positive and interesting mixture of public education, public higher education and private higher education. Uh, I, I honestly, you know, uh, and forgive me if this sounds rude, uh, I, I feel Greece is missing a trick. And I feel, you know, I mean, Greek, Greek higher education could be doing much, much better internationally uh, than it is uh, if, if some ideological shibboleths could be, could be somehow overcome. Then, I mean, uh, and then other forms of cleverness and intelligence that might uh, you know, that, that, that might take root in Athens and perhaps haven't to the possible extent, uh, haven't as much as one might have hoped. Um, you know, it, uh, I mean, it seems to me that, that you know, Greece and Athens, I mean, it's, it's the perfect place for, you know, to be a hub of, you know, high tech startups um, and, you know, another Silicon Valley, if you like. And, and it, 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 that is happening to some extent. And, you know, venture capital in that is being attracted to that field. Um, and, but, you know, th there are, uh, there are some encouraging signs. Um, you know, I mean, friends who are in that business tell me that you know the, the you know the, the legal barriers to opening a business are, are less than they were. They tell me that you know certain bureaucratic procedures have been simplified. Uh, it's easier to do them electronically. Uh, so you know, in 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 a number of ways, uh, you know, the, the the ground is being laid for for, for Athens to become a hub for high tech startups. Um, the, the, you know, the, the, one of the big big disincentives is. You know, legal uncertainty uh, and the kind, you know, the, the, the precariousness uh, and the slowness of the, of the Greek judicial system, uh, you know, a, a, a big disincentive to uh, in, in, in investing in anything at all, really. And, you know, so, um, but you know, I, I, I have friends in that sector, and um, you know, uh, it's it, exciting things are happening, and not I'm not not perhaps yet realizing the potential you know, of marrying sort of. You know, um, Greek brain power, which is never in question, uh, and you know the opportunities that are out there. Uh, but you know, I would and you know, Im imagine, you know, think of the damage that has been done to Greater a Athens through the process of trying to become a center of heavy industry, which really was never Greece's vocation. You know, with with the, you know, the huge you know refineries and steel factories and, and uh, have done permanent and lasting damage to the Athenian environment. 
whereas you know Athens uh, as uh, you know, a center of, of, sort of you know, brilliant high-tech startups could be you know the cleanest thing environmentally you can imagine and very much playing to Greek strengths uh, so that's you know that's a, a kind of wisdom that mark 21st century Athens you know uh, could, could 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 be showing um, now there was a third question about uh, yes the continuity of Athens as a I mean, and it correctly pointing out that sort of Athens, whether it was Frankish Athens or Ottoman Athens, or you know uh, uh, the, the various spaces of Frankish Athens, you know, it was a, it was at best uh, a, a small provincial town. It was a it, it was a significant pilgrimage center in Byzantine times. Um, it was you know it, it was a strategic strong point. Uh, it was a modestly flourishing Ottoman Balkan town. I mean, I, well, um, but um, you know, visitors to Athens, travelers to Athens in late Ottoman times, generally give you know they give a, a, um, a positive impression of the place as a place of you know high human capital and talent and exuberance and um, uh, but uh, um, in a sense, I think that Athens only began to uh, sort of you know, to, to, to to have a credible role as the center of Hellenism as it um, you know drew to itself um, people and skills and talents from the periphery of Hellenism, um, uh, in, 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 including from, from Asia Minor. Um, but, you know, I mean, a Athens really was a kind of, um, in, in the 19th century, I mean, it was, it, it had you know, some extravagant buildings which were, you know, had been erected by entrepreneurs who'd made their money in Egypt or uh, Odessa or some other place. Far, far from Athens, and they were, in a sense, showing off their money by building in the in, in their in their nation's national capital. Uh, but it wasn't uh, it, it wasn't really the hub of Hellenism because you know the commercial hub of Hellenism was 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 Smyrna, Izmir, um, and the you know and 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 in many ways you know the economic one of the economic hubs of Hellenism was uh, Istanbul, Constantinople. So, I mean, Athens really only ironically, I mean, it only became uh, in any credible way, the hub of Hellenism, when those you know, places on the periphery were uh, sort of, as it were, emptied in one circumstance or other of the Greek population. Now that's a fascinating, uh, fascinating point, because if one thinks uh, well back in history to say the seventh century BCE, of course, Athens wasn't really a hub of mm -hmm. Hellenism uh, at that time uh, either. And there were various factors that um, contributed to um, to making it um, making it so. Um, yeah, so um, I guess uh, maybe this would be a good time to ask uh, another question that um, that I had, just picking up on that theme. Speaking about you know what is the hub of, of Hellenism, I wonder, um, do you think uh, what role uh, did ancient the model of ancient Athens play? in modern Athens becoming uh, a hub of, of Hellenism? I mean, was there, uh, how much conscious uh, adoption of the ancient model was there in this phenomenon? Or was it more a uh, geographical economic um, kind of phenomenon? Uh, well, I think there was an enormous uh, effort to self-consciously mimic ancient Athens. And indeed, at, at times a rather stultifying one um, yes, I mean, I was just thinking, I was actually happened to be in the town of Nafplion uh, yesterday. Uh, I'm in Sparta now, by the way, um, uh, both fine towns and, you know, fine uh, bastions of Hellenism. Uh, and, uh, you know, Nafplion was, of course, the provisional capital of the embryonic Greek state, em uh, embryonic Greek kingdom. And, you know, there was a real argument, you know, do we, do we keep Nafplion as the capital? Or um, do we do we adopt Athens, which at that time was really a kind of, it was the Acropolis plus you know uh, a handful of very war battered streets and you know, not on a, not a promising place to, to make a capital at all. Uh, and Athens, of course, won out to some extent for sentimental reasons because you know it it it, it held out the glory of recreating the Periclean state. Um, and you know King Otto initially arrived in Napoleon and then. You know, he moved on quite rapidly to Athens, and um, you know, he, he was met with uh, all kinds of ancient Greek symbols, and um, uh, with an owl, and uh, with uh, the townspeople who, who were really uh, you know, excited by the prospect of rebuilding sort of a, a kind of Periclean, Periclean Athens anew. And then, of course, what they proceeded to do very rapidly 
was strip the Acropolis of all its accoutrements um, and every sign of anything that had happened there since the Periclean era. So the Frankish Tower was taken down eventually in the, um, and all the dwelling places uh, were removed. And really, I mean, every physical trace of all the uh, you know, immediately previous eras of the life of the Acropolis, the Ottoman time, the time as a Christian church, uh, and it was left as a sort of magnificent ruin uh, as a testimony only to the Periclean era. Uh, and so there was, I mean, in, in, in 19th century Athens, there was a kind of uh, an, an, an obsession uh, with um, you know, recreating the Periclean era, um, recreating the glories of ancient Greece, which, uh, you know, it, because, because you know, they were conceived in a rather perhaps ossified way, it, it, it had you know, at, at times rather a stultifying effect on, on, on the young state. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so we're now uh, on the hour, just past the hour. Um, I wonder if we might just extend for um, one or two more questions, perhaps another five minutes as we started, uh, started slightly late um, <laughs> here. And uh, let me just uh, pose one question here uh, from Despoina uh, Stamatelou. Um, who asks, um, I would like to ask uh, if your results and written speech is based on uh, photojournalism or personal um, observation. So a general question about uh, your source basis um, for, the, uh, for the study, which you have a wonderful bibliographical essay at the back of the book that, that sets it all out. But could you say a bit about, about that? Yeah, well, yes, indeed. Thank you for the question. Yes, I mean, I was drawing, of course, I, mean, I, I spent four years in Athens as a young Reuters reporter in the 1980s. Uh, and then professional life has drawn me back to Athens, not usually for as long as that, but you know for, for you know periods of six or eight weeks uh, ever since then. And so, I mean, I, I've built up, and I first lived in Athens as a seventeen-year-old back in the in the mid seventies. So I've built up quite a bit of experience of Athens in my in my sixty nearly sixty-four years of life. But I mean, no, I. Um, I mean, during the two years that I lived part time in Athens, um, you know, I did a lot of interviewing and uh, in particular focusing on kind of archaeologists and cultural figures, you know, who had themselves devoted their lives to one or other museum or site. Then during lockdown, uh, I would you know, thank goodness for Zoom, I was able to interview quite a number of people, um, including sort of uh, ladies and gentlemen in their 90s who had vivid memories of the Second World War and the dramatic events of December 1944. Um, it, well, it, of course, it would have been better to see them face to face. But in fact, and I was able to have you know, some quite rich and penetrating and informative conversations with you know, some, some, some ladies and gentlemen that I'm very grateful to indeed, uh, in which they share their experiences. <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, I think um, that probably uh, brings us to the to the limit of our time. Um, it only remains then then for me to thank you um, once again, uh, Bruce, for uh, giving us this wonderful overview uh, of the book uh, and for your um, engagement uh, with the questions, uh, some fascinating perspectives. I think about uh, building connections with the uh, Greek university system which is something that our center would be most interested in doing. And thank you for mentioning uh, NAFPLIO, where our Center uh, for Hellenic Studies also has um, an outpost um, at the current moment. So these are all issues that are quite uh, fundamental to, uh, to our operation. So thank you very much uh, for giving us um, your uh, wisdom, uh, indeed, gleaned from uh, the history of the, of the City of Wisdom. Let me recommend once again the book, um, I like the green cover myself more than the red <laughs> one, but uh, we, uh, those of us in uh, in the U.S. can can acquire it in green. It's the um, Irish green. <laughs> exactly. This is uh, it's, what, it's, what, it's, what is this? What's this then? Because it's, it's, it's the um, what what color is this? Would you say? I think is the is the Harvard crimson. Ah, uh, the Harvard okay, crimson. Harvard crimson. Very good. Okay. Very good. Well, we have here at the at the Harvard Center. We have at the CHS. We have the okay. green top. So um, glad to um, glad to have that. Uh, anything else that our other um, uh, welcomers would like to mention, Elaine or or Stratos, as we close. Congratulations to you know, to Bruce for for this great work and research. Mm. Yes, and let me add my kudos and thanks and and my hope that we can all meet uh, in person next time, Bruce, Let, as we, I hope so. as I hope we so. had planned in April 2020. Exactly. Uh, it would have been so good. But anyway, yes, but this is better than nothing. Yes. yes.
all the best into my home city of Sparta. Indeed, thank you so much. Yes, yes, I will, I will pass it on. Thank you so much. Very good indeed. Okay. Well, thank thanks to all of you very much for your interest in your in your kind comments.